I'm a school of teacher education um, a student. I am an undergrad student, and this is my senior year. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about myself in just a bit, um, but I also intern at Nemours um, with Pete's Academy, so I'm going to talk about that in a little bit as well. Um, but today I'm doing a presentation on giving students a voice with communication boards. So it's basically just how teachers can support students who have speech and language impairments. Um, so a little bit about myself. Again, my name is Megan Klein. I'm a current senior here at UCF studying elementary education. I'm completing my senior internship in a second grade classroom in Orange County. Um, I will be graduating this December. Um, so I'm really excited about that. I actually just finished applying to graduate school um, for communication sciences and disorders. Um, in my first internship last semester, I had the opportunity to complete part of it at the Nemours Children's Hospital with Pete's Academy. Um, it was one of the best experiences I've ever had. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that um, later, uh, like towards the end of my presentation. Um, but it was a great experience overall. Um, but education has always been something I've been very passionate about. And that's why I plan to further my education by earning my master's degree in communication sciences and disorders. So I can become a speech language pathologist and I plan to help children who have speech and language impairments. Um, so this quote, not being able to speak is not the same as not having anything to say. Um, this was said by Rosemary Crossley, who's an educator, an author, an activist um, from Australia. Um, she worked primarily with students who were nonverbal and had uh, the speech and language impairments. Um, so this is something that resonates deeply with me because I had the opportunity to work in an ESC classroom and shadow an SLP. Um, and she really just told me that um, even though these kids can't really communicate their wants and needs, um, they still have a lot going on out there. And I'm sure if we were giving them the tools needed to communicate, um, they would have a lot to say to us. So not being able to speak is really not the same as not having anything to say. Um, so I just want to take a second for you to kind of just think about that. Um, think about what you connect this quote with. Maybe you think of particular students in your classroom. Maybe you think of students who have learning disabilities. All right. So some quick numbers and stats. Um, so nearly 20% of students receiving special education services are receiving services for speech and language impairments. Um, so this estimate does not include children who receive services for speech and language disorders that are secondary to other conditions such as deafness. So um, let's say a student is already receiving special ed services because they have autism. That doesn't, they're not included in this number. So this is just for students who are receiving special education services just for speech and language. Um, about 87% with speech or language impairments receive services in the general education classroom. So this is a really um, big percentage and something that we as educators have to be cognizant of because 87% of students in our classrooms could have speech and language impairments. Um, so it's very important to be aware of that. Um, roughly 5% of children have noticeable speech disorders by the first grade. Um, so this is something more so for early education majors um, and those who are working with the early childhood population to be aware of because these are the individuals working with students who could have those speech and language impairments or like speech delays. Um, so just being aware of that these students could have noticeable speech disorders by the first grade um, is important. And then five to 10% of Americans may have communication disorders. So this number may not seem a lot, but when you think about um, the entire American population as a whole, five to 10% of Americans could have a communication disorder and that is a pretty large number. Um, so what is speech and language impairments? The American Speech and Hearing Association, otherwise known as ASHA, um, defines a communication disorder as an impairment in the ability to receive, send, process, and comprehend concepts or verbal, nonverbal, and graphic symbol systems. A communication disorder may be evident in the processes of hearing, language, and or speech. Um, so I know that was a very wordy definition. Um, so I'm kind of just going to break that down a little bit because communication disorders are basically, I think, I like to think of it as kind of like an umbrella. Um, so like communication disorder is like the big umbrella and then it like just branches out into speech disorders and then language disorders. Um, so etiologies, these are just the causes. Um, most of the time, um, researchers don't exactly know what is the main cause of someone's speech and language disorder, um, but there are different classifications of etiology. So it could be congenital, which means just existing at birth, 
Um, and when you think in general, usually it's um, those who are born with maybe like a cleft palate or a cleft lip. Um, developmental emerging during the preschool years. Um, so that's just has to do with the way that one's um, cognitive processes are developing and how their speech is developing and acquired. So that's usually the result of an injury, disease, or environmental insult. So um, typically people think of um, traumatic brain injuries or even strokes. However, strokes are more so for, um, they kind of affect the adult and geriatric population, so that doesn't really affect um, children. Um, but strokes are typically one of the main causes of speech and language impairments. Um, also hearing loss and meningitis are other examples of acquired etiologies that can lead to speech and language impairments. Um, what are speech disorders? A speech disorder or a speech impairment occurs when an individual's speech deviates to such a degree that it interferes with communication, attracts unfavorable attention, and adversely affects the listeners, the speaker, or both. And there are three types of speech impairments that are um, articulation disorders, fluency disorders, and voice disorders. Um, so some of the more mild examples that people typically think of when they hear the word speech disorders is stuttering and having a lisp. Um, so there are a lot of um, famous and notable people that have these speech disorders that you probably would never even realize, like um, presidential candidate Joe Biden is actually one of those individuals who has um, had stuttering as a child. And um, when I was researching all of that in his background, um, I was told that he actually didn't receive special education services and it was just something that he overcame as a child. And I think his parents really helped him work towards that. Um, but it just kind of goes to show that even though people can have speech disorders, it doesn't mean that they last forever. It just means that they might need the extra support and they might need to work harder towards it to overcome it. So people who have speech disorders can live a very normal life. And same with language disorders, um, but language disorders are a bit different from speech disorders. Um, so language disorders or language impairments occur when there is a delay or difficulties with mastery in one or more areas of language. Um, so that includes things like phonology, morphology, syntax, semantics, and pragmatics. So those are kind of the different branches of language. And um, children with language disorders may have difficulty expressing their thoughts or understanding what is said. Um, so they just may have trouble processing what is being said to them, or they may even have um, trouble expressing their thoughts. So they need extra time to kind of just gather those thoughts before they start spewing, because otherwise they may have um, words and letters that they're mixing up. Um, and there are several types of language disorders, but two of the main types are expressive and receptive language disorders. Um, so I'm not going to get into all the details of language disorders, because I'm just kind of here to give you a quick, brief um, rundown of what these disorders are, and then how we as teachers can help those who have speech and language impairment. Um, so speaking of, um, language tips for teachers and parents. So these are just a few ways that teachers and parents can support um, children who have language disorders in particular. Um, so simplifying speech, um, which is using short phrases and sentences, that's a great way um, to just support these students in and out of the classroom. Um, repetition, so the repeating of words, phrases over and over will really help. Um, giving wait time, so giving wait time is something that we should give to really all our students, regardless if they have a learning disability or speech and language impairment. Um, giving wait time can just be really beneficial for everyone, and typically we should give like three to five seconds at least um, to just let students think and wait. Um, and then be, being silly and then singing, those are some other things that teachers and parents can do in and out of the classroom. Um, so singing nursery rhymes and simple songs can help teach the rhythm of speech. Okay, so what are some of the most common speech and language impairments that we see in our schools? Um, so stuttering or stammering, um, that's the repetition of word, phrases, or parts of a word. Um, lisping, the inability to correctly pronounce sounds. So a lot of people are very uh, familiar with stuttering or lisping, but some other ones that are really popular are apraxia and aphasia. So apraxia causes errors with speech, rhythm, stress, and or intonation. Um, and aphasia is when one loses the ability to express speech. And this can be caused by brain damage, such as uh, traumatic brain injury and strokes. Um, so when I was at the Memorial Children's Hospital, I got to work a lot with um, those who had traumatic brain injury. Um, so I'm not sure if they had aphasia, but I'm sure they had an 
a form of aphasia or maybe even a mild form of aphasia because they did lose some of their ability to express themselves through speech. Um, and then issues related to autism. So this isn't um, really a speech and language impairment, but those who have autism or are on the spectrum um, can experience speech and language impairments. And majority of the time, these individuals do receive um, special education services for um, speech and language impairments. Um, so the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, reports that one out of every 68 children in our country have an autism spectrum disorder. And by definition, all children who have autism also have social communication problems. Um, so that's a good amount of children that do have autism or are on the spectrum. So that's why it's really important that teachers work alongside with speech and language um, pathologists because they work so closely to help these students um, meet their social communication needs. And then cerebral palsy and Down syndrome and just some other cognitive disorders can cause speech and language impairments. Um, so when I was at Pease Academy, I worked with a few students who did have cerebral palsy. And then even now in my um, regular classroom internship, I have a student who has Down syndrome and he does receive speech and language um, as under his IEP. Um, so that's why teachers really need to pay attention to IEPs because they could be receiving these services. Um, so that's just something to be cognizant of. And then cerebral palsy, there are actually lots of children in schools that have cerebral palsy. Um, it's something that is just usually people are born with cerebral palsy um, and it just affects the way um, the one's mind works. And then it can also affect like physical abilities as well. Okay, so what is augmentative and alternative communication? Um, so this is called AAC for short. Um, so AAC is any form of communication that takes the place of or supplements one's speech. Um, so some examples are like sign language, facial expressions, printed communication boards, and high-tech devices such as speech uh, generating devices, SGDs, are all examples of AAC. An easy way to remember all of this is that if it is not speech, then it is AAC. So I think sometimes um, people who are in the speech and language disorder world um, are kind of confused with this term, but basically if it's not speech, it's just a form of AAC. Um, AAC can range from low tech to high tech and there are pros and cons to both. Um, so like low tech is really good because um, they don't really require, it's, it's not like an electronic device. Um, so they can be fairly inexpensive um, and they can just be um, pretty easy to access. Um, but those high tech devices, sometimes they're a little bit more, uh, they're a little bit better because sometimes they have those speech generating um, abilities. So like if, let's say it's on an iPad or something like that, then a student can just touch it and then it would like just speak for them. Um, whereas like a low tech device may not be able to do that. Um, but then there are some cons to high tech devices because they can be very expensive. They could be hundreds to thousands of dollars. So um, not every school can afford those high tech devices. And that's why it's up to us teachers to try and um, come up with ways that we can include assistive technology such as these low tech devices. Um, printed communication boards are considered to be low tech AAC devices because they do not require an electrical output. Um, this form of assistive technology is so easy to implement in the classroom and Boardmaker is a website that can help educators and parents create their own communication boards. Um, so these are just some examples of low-tech um, printed communication boards and these were made on Boardmaker. Um, I'm gonna show these more um, up close so you can all see, um, but basically like these are just a great way to help students who have speech and language impairments, those who are nonverbal, um, even those who are English language learners, I think English language language learners can benefit greatly from communication boards, um, even though these students can speak and usually don't have speech and language impairments. Um, they're still really important and they can be used because they have a lot of visuals on here um, and this can help them learn English. Okay, and then this is just kind of like, um, like a spectrum of low tech to high tech and then there are mid tech devices. So these are some that like kind of incorporate um, electronic devices, but then also has like that um, pencil paper um, aspect to it. Um, so low tech, um, like I said, the communication boards, um, we have single message communicators. I've never really used these before, um, but I have been doing some research on them and they can be very helpful. Um, these are fairly inexpensive. 
um, simple level speech generating devices. So these like, I like to think of them kind of like those books that um, kids have and they're kind of like touch them and then it makes a sound or plays music. It's kind of like that. Um, and then tablets with communication applications. So this could just be on someone's cell phone or an iPad. Um, and there are apps that you can download. I'm gonna talk about one of the apps in a little bit. Um, and then we also have some of these speech generating devices um, that are a little bit more, um, sorry, they're a little bit more um, technology incorporated. Oh. Okay, so here are some examples of low tech AEC devices. And this is what I'm gonna be talking mostly about today, just because these are the ones that we can implement uh, more easily in the classroom. Um, so I really like this one. Um, I know it doesn't look as maybe as pretty as these ones do, um, but I think it's so smart that someone just decided to use, it looks like a um, like a baking sheet almost, and they just printed out some pictures and wrote, with, um, wrote words on them. Um, so that is a um, really unique way to create a communication board, and this would work if you didn't really have all the resources needed to create communication boards. You can just um, find images and clip art on Google and then just print them out and create your own communication board that way. Um, so these communication boards down here, they look like they were made with BoardMaker. So this is the app, um, website for BoardMaker and I believe BoardMaker also has an app that you can download on your phone or any other electronic device. The only thing with BoardMaker is that it does cost money. So it is not really a cheap website to be a part of and to subscribe to. Um, but they do offer a 30 day free trial. So if you want to try it out, see if you like it or not before you purchase, you can do that. And I believe um, Orange County Public Schools does provide board maker to teachers because I know if you go onto your OCPS launch pad, you might be, I saw a board maker on it the other day and was just trying to figure it out. But um, basically I think OCPS and some other school districts may already pay for that subscription. So it's worth um, checking out. And then these are some examples of high-tech devices. Um, so these kind of look like speech generating devices where if a child just um, clicks on the symbol or the word, then it will um, speak those words for them. And when I was working in the ESD classroom, all the students had these high-tech devices. Um, all these students were nonverbal, so these were very, very helpful um, in understanding what their wants and needs were. Um, they did have these communication boards, like these low-tech ones too, and these were really good because we would do, um, if you needed to do it for like a particular activity, you can kind of just like make a, a communication board just for that one activity. I'll talk about that in just a second as well. Um, but these are really, really helpful for um, mostly those who are nonverbal. And then Proloquo, um, I don't even know if I'm saying that right, Pro Proloquo to go, um, a voice for those who cannot speak. This is another app that can be downloaded on um, any electronic device. It is pretty expensive though, kind of just like BoardMaker is. Um, but you know, this is something to definitely look into, especially once you're in the classroom and you're teaching. Um, you can always talk to um, whoever the ESC coordinator is at the school, see if you can get access to that or even talk to the principal of the school. Um, I'm sure anybody would be willing to try and help out these students if needed. Okay, I'm gonna show this video, it's Steve's story. Um, and this is just kind of um, giving you an example of how these speech generating devices work and how um, Steve is a person who uses these speech generating devices to help him, you know, get around in the real world and then also communicate. Oops. I am 33 years old and of hypnotoneuron disease for two half years. I live in Sheffield with my wife Sarah and two sons, Charlie and Maxwell. I have been unable to use my fingers to type since around November 2013. I have used the eye gaze system since then. The communication software has been the biggest improvement. It is quite slick and fast. 
the dwell free keyboard is so quick i find i have to really know what i want to say it is sometimes quicker than my mind the device has been integral in helping me remain in work also i have set up a micro blurry we have made around 15 brews so far i was even able to design a logo and pump clips I don't think you can underestimate the effects that being able to communicate can have. It is critically important for me to be able to communicate with my sons. Thus daddy can turn the cartoons on which they appreciate. It is so important to my family that I am able to communicate with my sons and wife. It has made a massive difference to our lives. You don't have to live without a voice. Okay, and then the makers of um, these devices, it's usually, it's by Toby um, Divinox, and they're the ones that basically created Board Maker as well, um, to just to help these individuals who need to have a voice in order to communicate. Okay, so these are just some communication boards I'm gonna run through. So this is a basic request communication board. Um, also at the end, you're also um, going to receive these communication boards so that way you can have in your own classrooms. Um, so this one is really good just because it has pretty much everything that um, someone would need like um, using I, me, my, mine, um, I want. So students can use, we, like to call it their talking finger. So we'd say, okay, use your talking finger, show me what you want. So they can just point and be like, I want, and then they can point to it. Or I want to drink, I want to eat, um, I want my walker, my wheelchair. Um, so this is just um, a really incredible assistive technology device that can be used in any classroom. Um, here is an art one and also has some basic requests on it. Um, but this can also be used in an art classroom or whenever you're doing an art project with your students. Um, so you can make um, communication boards for really anything. And then this is one for the read aloud, brown bear, brown bear, what do you see? Um, so I know a lot of kids like reading this book and um, communication boards are so, so helpful for all students and then they can even help them read aloud a book. Um, so I did this with one of my students in the ESC classroom and we got to basically read the book together and they would use their talking finger and I'd say, okay, point to the brown bear and they would do brown bear, brown bear. And then they would point to like, what do you see? I think there's a what word here. I cannot find it. Sometimes they're hard to find. Oh, here it is. What? And then do you see? Um, and then when they want to turn the page, they just point to that. And then we use, um, this is another form of an assistive technology that you can use in your classroom too, especially those who have physical um, impairments, um, puffing the pages. Um, so I, I don't know why I didn't include a picture of that, but like puffing the pages in a book using um, those little like pom-poms that people use for like art projects and stuff, you can glue those down to pages and we just call it puffing. So that way it's easier for the students who have those physical impairments, especially with their hands, they can turn the pages easier. So that's what we would do um, in that ESC classroom to help those students. Um, and then Pete the Cat and his four groovy buttons communication board. Um, I love this book and I think it'd be a great way to incorporate math and then ELA and who says you can't help those um, who cannot speak to read this book. And again, this is great for English language learners too. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about UCF Peds Academy at the Nemours Children's Hospital now. Um, I just want to play this quick video because there might be some of you that might not know what Peds Academy is, and it's just a wonderful program. Um, I have nothing but wonderful things to say about it, so I'm just going to show a quick video introducing what Peds Academy is. medical advances for children with chronic and complex medical conditions have advanced at a really rapid rate and education hasn't caught up with those children or, or kept up uh, with medical advances. So even children who face some of the most insidious diseases now, they survive. And very simply put, the, the cost of living cannot be education. 
Peds Academy, it's the world's first pediatric school program that's research-backed and dedicated to educating children in ways that are specific to their disease, phenotype, or condition. Sometimes being in the hospital is, is stressful. It can be stressful for the parents, stressful for the, the patient, obviously. And we are always looking for ways to try to make that experience a little easier to cope with, and whether it's a surgical procedure or, you know, a day in the infusion center. You know, if, if they are engaged, if their mind is engaged, I think the whole experience goes so much better. You see them light up, you see their enthusiasm. I think it makes a world of difference. Our purpose is to provide those really rich, meaningful educational experiences so that children aren't just keeping pace with their healthy, typically developing peers, but that they're actually getting extraordinary educational opportunities like robotics and immersive and augmented virtual reality while they're here in the hospital. Do you feel yourself? Well, she definitely enjoys putting the, making the robots do you know, all kind of silly things. The challenge of learning whenever you're in and out of the hospital is that there's no consistency. So it helps to have someone else come in that, to kind of explain things. I'm not good at explaining them to her. Some parents, when they learn what this is, have been immediately brought to tears, just tears of joy that they're gonna have some support in being able to navigate the education for the child while they go through this, this experience, which in some cases will span years. I think it's definitely going to help her whenever she goes back to school. It's so exciting. It's such a high level of motivation for them that what we see in Peace Academy is, yes, I'll do that thing. We're, we're having to set time limits and say, okay, we've got to move on to the next uh, room and, you know, we'll be back tomorrow. But I think some of them would keep us in there all day. Okay, so that was a little bit about um, Pete's Academy at the Nemours Children's Hospital. I'll talk briefly about it on the next slide. Let me see if I'm able to get back to it. Sorry about this. Oh, okay. All right. So some more information about Peds Academy. Um, so like you heard, Peds Academy does provide that hands-on educational activity component to students. Um, and they provide opportunities for children and even the siblings visiting the Morris. Um, there were a few times where I would visit a patient's room and there would be their older brother or sister or maybe younger brother or sister. Um, so we not only got to provide opportunities for the child that was in the hospital, but also for their family and their siblings. And that really taught me to kind of like think on my toes. And as educators, we have to think on our toes all the time. Um, but, you know, providing those accommodations on the fly or differentiating instruction based on a child's physical or cognitive abilities um, that is one of the most valuable takeaways I've experienced um, from this internship. Um, I was unfortunately only there for a very short amount of time um, because of the pandemic and everything. I was there in the latter half um, of last semester, so that did get cut short, but I would do anything to be back at Peds Academy. It is just such a wonderful experience. I can't speak any more highly about it, um, and I think everyone should go through it. If you know, if it's that, that's for you. Um, but you just learn so much about how to provide um, those accommodations to students that you normally can't get in a regular classroom. Um, and you're also providing instruction and doing lesson plans for students across all content areas, um, all grade levels. Um, so you're not just stuck to like one grade level as well. So you're working with kids of all ages um, and on all content areas. And there, Nemours is really big on using technology and STEM um, to provide education. So we have like these um, robots called Dot and Dash and it teaches kids how to code. And it's just a um, awesome experience. The kids love it. They always want to see Dot and Dash um, in their rooms. And it's just, it's so fun. The day goes by so fast when you're there and you're like, oh, it's time to go already. And you don't want to leave. The kids don't want you to leave. The parents don't want you to leave. It's just an incredible experience and I recommend it to anyone. Um, so if anybody has any questions about Peds Academy, please let me know. I can even have you get in touch with the coordinators there. Um, and then I also provided some links in this presentation. So this is um, 
the application. So if you're interested in applying for it or wanna know if you're eligible to apply for it, um, this link has it all. And then this link down here, Nemours link, um, that's just providing a little bit more background of Nemours, um, but I hope I covered pretty much everything. <laughs> Um, and then some helpful resources for parents, teachers, and speech language pathologists. So I could, the list goes on. I had to limit it to just one slide. I tried to include the ones that I think are probably the most important ones or the most helpful for information. Um, so of course, the American Speech Language Hearing Association or ASHA, um, they're just an amazing organization. Um, they support students who are trying to become SLPs or audiologists, um, and they provide resources for parents, teachers, um, you name it, they have it. Um, the Center for Parent Information and Resources on Speech and Language Impairments, um, a great resource for parents. Um, maybe not so much teachers, but this is something that teachers can provide for those parents who have a child who has a speech or language impairment. Um, the Division for Communication Disabilities and Deafness, Council for Exceptional Children, um, great resource for pretty much everyone. Um, the National Association of Special Education Teachers, um, definitely more so for teachers than it is for parents. Um, but like I said earlier, teachers work so closely with SLPs and even other school personnel. So it's, even if you're just becoming a general education teacher, um, this is still something to look into and it might give you some helpful resources um, in providing uh, differentiated instruction for those students who have uh, special education services. Um, Project Ideal, another great, um, resource for parents, teachers, and SLPs. And then of course, board maker, which can be used to create your communication boards. Um, if anybody has any questions at all, like I'd be more than happy to answer any of them. Or if you're interested in connecting with me, um, you can just email me. Again, I'm Megan Klein. Um, so I am still a senior undergraduate student here at UCF. Um, and I'm graduating this December. I also just applied to graduate school for UCF's Communication Science Disorders Program. So if anyone has any questions about what it's like to apply to the program or what the requirements are, um, just shoot me an email and I'd be more than happy to get back to you and connect with you. Um, but thank you so much for giving me this time today to present to you all this information. I know it was a lot. I'm going to include this presentation um, so that way that you guys have it and then also all of the communication boards will be sent to you as well. So thank you so much for joining me today.